Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. For President Obama and America's allies, the recent terrorist attacks in Paris are causing a strategic reassessment. This week at the annual G20 summit, the attacks dominated the discussion among world leaders as they grappled with the threat of extremism. Joining us uh, now with his analysis is Paul Pillar. He's a 28-year veteran of the CIA and the National Intelligence Council. He served the United States intelligence uh, community in a number of positions, including chief analyst at the CIA's Counterterrorism Center and national intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia. He's a senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Center uh, for the 21st Century Security and Intelligence Group. Thank you very much for joining us, Paul. Good to be with you, Jim. Listen, um, we have the continuing conflicts in, uh, in Syria and Iraq, uh, and we have now a series of terrorist acts way beyond that theater. Um, in the Sinai, uh, we've had uh, in, in Ankara, of course, uh, in Beirut, um, and now in Paris. Um, the issue is complex, I think, and I want to help if we could try to unravel it. And I'd, I'd like to sort of go piece by piece and take a look at, at it and see if you can help us understand a little bit more of what's going on. First, with regard to the, the I, I want to just do the, the the three actions, uh, the, the terrorist acts, the Sinai, uh, Beirut, and, um, uh, and now Paris. Um, is there a change in ISIS's strategy here? Um, it always was Al-Qaeda that had the global reach uh, right. that was hit them there uh, and, and not focusing on developing a home base. ISIS had a different strategy. Is there a strategic shift here observable, or don't we know? Well, first of all, we, we, we don't know because it's uh, a mistake to draw a lot of conclusions uh, from incidents that have occurred just recently and for which the investigations have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. You're quite right, Jim, that uh, there's a basic strategic difference between al-Qaeda and ISIS with regard to uh, al-Qaeda's uh, main doctrine and strategy was centered around hit the far enemy, meaning the West, especially the United States, whereas ISIS, by contrast, has been uh, building its so-called caliphate and concentrating on the here and now. Um, the extra dimension, though, is to what extent is the uh, participation or interference from ISIS's point of view in, in the caliphate and what's going on in Syria and Iraq a reason for retaliation and revenge? And each of those incidents, Beirut, Sinai, and, and Paris, you know, may in fact uh, be that. Um, I mean, in terms of what we know now in, in the investigations, uh, I think it's uh, at least a, a decent uh, bet to say that that's part of the motivation. Uh, I wouldn't go farther than that. I mean, the, the Sinai, for example, the Russians just in the last day have said, yes, it was, a, was in fact a bomb. Um, so we know that. Uh, but the group in the Sinai that has adopted the ISIS name, but had a, its own previous existence, is one that has been battling against the LCC regime in Egypt. And uh, I think it's uh, fair to assume that uh, their motivations and their interests are still pretty much focused on trying to overthrow the Egyptian government, and that that's at least as important for them as any uh, thing that uh, might be important to the high command in Raqqa. When it comes to the uh, uh, the, the attack in Beirut, uh, I think it's perhaps even more straightforward that that was a retaliatory sort of thing given the involvement of Hezbollah in particular in the Syrian conflict. Paris, um, there's a lot that we still have to find out. And in terms of what's dribbled out of the investigation so far, I would say this has at least as much to do with a Belgian-based gang and what's going on in the suburbs of Brussels and Paris. Uh, and the, connections so far, at least that we, the public, know about mm -hmm. uh, with Syria or with any kind of ISIS decision making is pretty tenuous. That was actually the next question, and that is um, they talk about command and control and whether, you know, with Al Qaeda there was always a sense that it was centrally driven. Um, ISIS seems to let out franchises. Um, if you wake up in the morning and you've got a gripe uh, and you've got an armed group, you can say, I declare my loyalty to. Um, to what extent do we know, uh, can we assume that these efforts are all linked to ISIS even, just simply because they declare them that? Or, or is there a strategic vision of attacking here, attacking there, or just don't we know? 
Uh, again, the short, immediate answer is, is we don't know. Yeah. And, you know, as someone who's, who's studied terrorism for over 20 years, I always hate that word link because it, it tends to be used yeah. very loosely uh, in the media and in other discussions. You know, links can go everything from on one extreme, command and control and instigating and directing and financing an operation, uh, to on the other extreme, the most casual sort of contact that really means very little in terms of uh, But the political operation. rhetoric that is, that is coming forth is that it is a command and control operation. That is the political rhetoric. I, the political rhetoric, as usual, is running well ahead of, of uh, the information. Um, and, and I think we will find out more as the investigation uh, proceeds with regard to Paris, which is the one that's held the West's attention. So my next series of questions all had to do with <laughs> what they were going to get out of this, and I, yeah. I, and I think that's what we don't know. Um, it, there always was the speculation with... Uh, dragging America into Afghanistan to sort of ground them down in a war. That was the idea that was projected about why uh, Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. struck. Um, uh, Russia's already involved in, um, uh, in Syria before the Sinai bombing. Uh, Hezbollah is already involved before it. And France is already bombing, not in Syria, but they were bombing in, yeah. in Iraq. Um, it, if you pull yourself back from what we know to speculate from based on your experience, is there any logic to this that, that, that seems to, to make sense of why they would hit these targets? Um, are, are, are they, is, is there any desirability on their part in dragging the French more in, uh, the Russians more in? Yeah, there, there are two ways to interpret this which point to an opposite directions. One is a parallel to, to the Al-Qaeda reasoning that you mentioned, uh, that it does suit their purpose to drag Western governments in more, uh, which uh, tends to support the narrative that this is a struggle between Muslims and the Judeo-Christian West, and that they, the group in question, Al-Qaeda before ISIS now, is the one that is protecting a Muslim population against the predations of a Judeo-Christian West. Um, I think there's logic to that. Um, what ISIS has to weigh against that, which is somewhat different from Al-Qaeda, given that they basically have more to lose with their mini-state that they've already established in, in uh, Syria and Iraq, which goes beyond you know, what Al-Qaeda ever had on the ground, uh, is the direct kinetic physical you know, destruction um, that is surely a minus. And, and how that nets out in the thinking of decision makers in Raqqa, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I, I think... Uh, Probably part of the calculation, as you noted, is that, well, they're coming after us already. Um, and to suck the likes of the French and the Americans in further so we get more of this propaganda payoff it, it, uh, might, might outweigh any additional physical, uh, physical damage. It almost seems that, you know, uh, given the difference, the way al-Qaeda operated and the way uh, ISIS thus far has operated, that I wonder if they woke up in the morning after the Paris attack and said, oh crap, uh, this is not what we want. Um, because it does threaten them in a way that they can ill afford to be threatened with uh, a massive uh, assault on Raqqa or on Mosul. Um, I, I think it, it, they're going to say different things waking up on different mornings. Again, the Al-Qaeda experience or our experience with Al-Qaeda is uh, instructive. Um, uh, probably, I think this is the dominant view I would share it, is that after the uh, start of Operation Iraqi Freedom in the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, uh, there was some oh crap on the part of al-Qaeda's uh, hierarchy, say this isn't quite what we had in mm -hmm. mind. Uh, but then what came after that? Well, you had the invasion of Iraq and, and other events that I think uh, would cause um, the al-Qaeda hierarchy to say, well, yeah, we this the sucking the Americans into doing destructive things that we can you know, work with from a propaganda point of view, on balance may have uh, helped us. So uh, you know, how it's going to net out from ISIS's point of view, or our viewpoint of ISIS's point of view, I think uh, has yet to be determined. But, it, but it, you, you've got these conflicting considerations between the symbolism and the imagery on one side and the actual physical effect on the ground on the other side. You made the point in one of your recent writings about the political pressures that then uh, get placed on political leaders right. to do certain things. Uh, the French obviously right now, uh, the, the French president is sounding like a, a wartime president. Uh, it has not been his character mm -hmm. before. Uh, and France has stepped up its bombing in Syria as opposed to in Iraq where, where it was 
active. Um, we learned, I, I would hope, after Afghanistan that uh, simply destroying the infrastructure and the leadership of a movement doesn't destroy the movement itself. What are the lessons of Afghanistan uh, that, that the French and the Russians and the Americans need to be wary of as we approach this Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, ISIS phenomenon? Well, you, in effect, just stated the main one, which is you know, physical destruction of, of something on the ground, including the headquarters or, or home haven, if you will, of a group, is not to be equated with extinguishing uh, some terrorist threat in the West that's associated with that group, whether it's one that is uh, directed uh, from whatever this foreign haven is, or rather as a matter of the name being invoked by others who have other uh, motivations to, to act as they do. Um, uh, that's one thing. Uh, and, and the other thing is just uh, how much difference a physical safe haven abroad does or does not make. And this is going to be something that will be very interesting to follow as the investigation on the Paris uh, attacks uh, play out. Um, it, it looks like maybe, you know, Belgium and Brussels played the role that Hamburg did with 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, and some other things were going on in France that played the role of flight schools in the United States. And the fact that there was some other kind of haven or what's looked at as a haven in Afghanistan, in the case of Al-Qaeda, in uh, northeastern uh, Syria, in the case of ISIS and ISIS Central, may actually have been, in my view probably was, one of the less important factors. Uh, in making possible and leading to the attack that transpired. The, the, the situation in Belgium, the situation in Paris, um, both are, 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 are disconcerting, not only because of the extremist com groups that are, are, are there, but that the conditions in both countries seem to breed this phenomenon. A lot is made of extremism and extremist preachers and the messages of extremism. But what concerns me is the demand. I mean, it, it, yeah. you can have a, a preacher saying, be angry, do this, but the young kid has to wake up in the morning and say, I want to hear this. They're, they're, it's like drugs. You can have it available, but, but somebody has to want it. And there seems to be way too many young people uh, in France and in Europe generally um, who seem to want it. Uh, the, the countries have alienated their young Muslim populations uh, rather than incorporating them. Um, I'm not hearing that in this discord, in the, in the discourse that's taking place right now. The, unfortunately, it is not being heard as much as it should. Yes, social and economic conditions, integration or lack of integration in a larger society are important. Uh, this is one thing that uh, some, some specialists have viewed, and I agree to this, with this to some extent, as a difference between Western Europe and the United States in that um, uh, Muslims in the United States tend to be more integrated, you know, less ghettoized than we see in, in Britain, France, Germany, Belgium. And that's true, although we ought to be careful not to push this a little bit too far when we see a case like Nadal Hassan and the, you know, mm -hmm. the Fort Hood shooting. Uh, here you have an army officer that's about as integrated as, as, as you can get. Um, but conditions do matter. Um, and the, uh, the relationship between a minority community uh, such as in this suburb of uh, Brussels that we now have learned about uh, that, that uh, involved the uh, suspected attackers in Paris, its relationship uh, with the rest of the society, its, whether it's integrated or not, does in fact matter. There's, there are two population movements taking place. There's the refugees moving one way and then there's these young people moving the other way. Um, and ISIS has fed off of this importation of foreign fighters, uh, more than even domestic recruitment. Um, what's troubling uh, in this aftermath is the not just not paying attention to the domestic conditions that helped spawn it, but the conflation of the two. Uh, the refugees are a security threat, is what we've been told. And uh, America's reacted one way, but the European reaction has been uh, equally deplorable, borders being closed and far right-wing parties uh, gaining some steam from the, the problem. This is only going to make it worse. Yes. Now, in the case of the Paris attacks, there is this one tidbit uh, that suggests, you know, one of the suspected attackers may have come in as part of a refugee flow. So that's going to feed the phenomenon you talked about. Although I, I saw a Guardian story that said that an identical passport with different fingerprints was found uh, with a guy who they arrested 
um, in Serbia. It, it, it still needs to be sorted out. Yeah. And, but, but the main point is, you know, that, that kind of talk that you were referencing came before any of this yeah. evidence or purported evidence. You know, we, we've heard the same sorts of things here in the United States with regard to the idea that, uh, you know, Hezbollah are going to wait across the Rio Grande from Latin America and pose a threat to the United States. Uh, and now, of course, um, uh, we're, we're getting uh, uh, rhetoric that goes even farther than that with regard to uh, the Syrian refugees, uh, of, of which um, the United States, as you well know, has taken in a very small proportion, you know, quite in contrast to the likes of, of Germany. And the difference in Europe is not just that you have to get on a plane, be vetted, and, and mm -hmm. brought over, but they found both a sea route and land route, which mm -hmm. poses two problems for Europe. One is a, 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 a simply a logistic problem. Whether they want to incorporate them or not, they've got over a million people. Um, and the numbers suggest that we're going to see another million, maybe two or more in the next few years. Um, that poses a, a, a security challenge of a, of a different sort in Europe. I mean, they're not going to find a, a European Don Trump who's going to say, let's put them all on buses and send them back. How does Europe deal with this? And what assistance can the United States be to Europe to help them figure out a rational? And not that we've solved our migrant problem from the South either, but, but certainly they're not behaving well uh, with regard to dealing with this issue that is not just at their doorstep, but it's now inside their doors. Well, it's, it's a numbers problem. And, and it, it's, uh, uh, the huge numbers are a problem just looking at it strictly as a humanitarian refugee problem and then as a security problem in terms of you know, keeping track of, of uh, possible terrorists or extremists in that midst. Uh, it's a numbers problem as well, and that, that's basically the story so far as it's emerged in terms of what the Belgians, you know, did or did not tell the French with regard to this uh, gang uh, in Brussels. But I mean, the numbers are staggering, and um, uh, one has to take one's hat off to Chancellor Merkel, and what, what she, I mean, she's taking a courageous political position here, in in uh, basically opening up Germany to the extent that she has. Uh, but, but she would have to admit there's a numbers problem, too, with regard to assimilation, with regard to just you know, basic meeting basic needs, not to mention the whole security thing, which has now been, uh, I mean, it was already there all along, but with the Paris incidents, it has but been badly thing, conflated. The security thing, not just in the sense of a terrorist, but if you have two, three million people um, camped out sure. in your country, uh, and no way to process, assimilate, or incorporate them into your society, that then becomes a, a I mean, we've had the Roma, and the Europe yeah. hasn't done well with that. Th this creates almost, a, manufactures a new demographic challenge that Europe has to deal with. Well, and, and it, it simply enlarges the problem we were talking about just a couple of minutes ago with regard to um, communities in ghettoized suburbs of cities mm -hmm. uh, that already uh, present a problem of uh, insufficient assimilation with the larger society. I want to shift to um, Vienna. One of the things that came out of Paris, maybe the only positive, was uh, a new sense of solving the Syria crisis. Mm -hmm. It created a different sense of uh, cooperative discussion among the U.S. and the Russians. Uh, and even the Saudis showed some movement uh, in, in Vienna. Um, this is not to suggest that solving Syria solves the problem, but certainly solving Syria is an important piece here that has to be uh, factored in. From what you know of what came out of Vienna, is there reason to be uh, hopeful here, or is it, uh, was it an empty process? Well, we should be pleased with what came out of Vienna just from the standpoint of who was, who was in the room. And p particularly, you know, the Saudis and the Iranians in the same room, which, I mean, that, that's, that's progress in mm -hmm. itself. Um, and I think we saw the start of a, of a multilateral diplomatic process that, that is pointing in a direction where in terms of the general principles, and this is part of the statement that was, that was made out of Vienna, um, as far as the general principles as opposed to detailed implementation is concerned, uh, it's pretty clear what direction the world community has to lead, and that is one where looking at that key question that people keep asking of the, the future of Assad, that he won't be part of the future over the long term, but this doesn't mean he's going to be booted out tomorrow or next week. And there is a, an appropriate consciousness on the part of us and the Russians and others that 
if it was a matter of simply booting them out uh, uh, very hastily, then you've got this question of how much of a governmental structure is still going to be there? Are we creating even worse chaos than, uh, uh, than we might have uh, had before? Um, so that, that provides a framework, and I think it's a basis for optimism in addition to the fact that you've got all the players around the table for the first time. The the next round will include the Syrian opposition, and mm -hmm. the Jordanians uh, have been given the um, the rather un I, I would think that the task the the the, the least uh, promising task of all uh, to select who are the terrorist groups the the extremist groups who should be excluded from that. Uh, that's a no win proposition for the Jordanians. Um, how will that work out as as you understand? I mean. It, it, Everybody's got a different sense of who the terrorists are, and I think that it's uh, uh, it's it's not a comfortable place to be in for for poor King Abdullah. Oh, it's, it certainly isn't, and I think any kind of formula that emerges is going to have to be something other than the Jordanians or the uh, international community generally coming up with a list that is very specific as part of the negotiated formula. It's going to be have to be more of a of a process. That, that somehow blurs the lines with regard to these groups where there's not an agreement whether they should be excluded or not. I don't know what that process is. I don't have a formula in the back of uh, my head, but that's what you know, the diplomatic planners are supposed to think is about. Is it possible to imagine at this point um, a U.S.-Russian with Saudi-Iranian support, the regime and the opposition that is the one we accept, joining forces to to deal with ISIS? Yes, I think so. And, and in fact, one of the very recent developments that I think uh, increases the odds on that is the Russian reaction to the, to the plane crash in Sinai, mm -hmm. um, where, uh, I mean, the immediate reaction seemed to be to join the French with some, you know, some, uh, some military operations that really are directed against ISIS, not against other groups, which most of their airstrikes so far have been. Uh, and I think that probably has increased the, uh, the Russian motivation to be part of a, a joint effort in Syria where it's understood uh, we got to deal with this because ISIS is a problem for everyone. Mm -hmm. And we can't deal with the ISIS problem unless we somehow form, uh, find a, a workable political formula for Syria. The next question is, do you solve a, a problem in Syria without solving Iraq as well? Um, because it is a, a transnational, it is a cross-border phenomenon. Sure. And both share the same thing. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's an aggrieved community that has felt disenfranchised, a, a majority in Syria and a minority in, um, in, um, in Iraq. Um, and one suggests that you can find a way to solve it in each country but in the process of doing that, you alienate uh, important factors and uh, forces in the other country. I mean, how, how do you deal with Syria and then Iraq? Can you deal with them simultaneously? Is there a will to do this? Uh, well, they have to be dealt with simultaneously. Um, I, I'm, I'm somewhat more optimistic in the near term about Iraq. Complicated as it is, it's not quite as complicated and messy as Syria. Um, I think it was a positive step uh, when Maliki was replaced by Abadi as, as prime minister. Um, um, I mean, we, we can point to plenty of problems since then, but, but in terms of the, uh, at least a willingness to be more inclusive and less authoritarian, um, uh, that seems to have been a, a step forward. Um, there has been some progress on the ground, most recently with the, uh, you know, the Sinjar action uh, that involved mainly the Peshmerga. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, for Iraq as well as Syria, the ISIS problem cannot be separated from the larger problem of the political future and distribution of power in the whole state. And, and it has to be simultaneously both in Iraq and Syria. In polling we did in Iraq, we found a profoundly deep divide uh, with Sunni and Shia on the issue of the popular mobilization forces, which are Shia-led, uh, with their support for the government, which despite the fact that Maliki is more open uh, I'm sorry that uh, that uh, uh, the current president Abedi, is more yeah. open. Abidi is more open. There still is a sense of, uh, of of frustration that they have not been incorporated enough. Um, and uh, the, but the only thing that all of them agree on is that the final solution for Iraq is that the central government has to be representative of all the people in the country. There was no interest in partition, even among the Kurds. Mm -hmm. the, I guess the question is, 
why couldn't we do with the Sunni population what we did in 2006, which is provide them with uh, the, the support to create the independent militia? I know that there have been efforts to do that, but it seems that the central government hasn't been as supportive of that effort. Well, because there's just there's distrust on on the uh, the central government side as well as on the uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the Sunni Arab side in in, in Anbar. Um, you know, ultimately, it it it's not going to rest on competing militias. It's going to have to rest on uh, a security as well as a political structure at the center that does reflect you know the concerns and the participation of all the communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I think it also will involve a degree of decentralization of political power. There's a whole continuum between you know, outright separation and breaking up Iraq versus a unitary state. Um, you know, the Kurds have enjoyed something close to de facto separation for quite some time now. Um, uh, breaking up the state, you know, in my view, is always not going to work because you've got very messy lines and exactly where you draw the lines you know, because of the ethnic cleansing that mm -hmm. occurred during the war, the lines quite, aren't quite as messy and detailed as they were before, but they're still pretty messy. Um, you know, how, what do you do with Baghdad, basically, is, yeah. is the main problem. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I think, you know, a you know, cantonization kind of political structure that will uh, give people in Anbar and, and else the other uh, Sunni uh, Iraqi population more of a sense that they have uh, control over their own destiny, even though they're, they're not the majority at the central government uh, will, will help. And the final piece of this is that behind each one of these conflicts is a power struggle between Iraq, uh, between Iran rather, and, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Saudis uh, deeply concerned since 1979 uh, that Iran was projecting its revolution across the water. It, it has taken a sectarian um, uh, edge to it, but it wasn't sectarian initially. It was a it was a power struggle between Iran seeking hegemony and the Gulf Arabs rejecting that and projecting their own uh, their own sort of desire to to Im impose their order uh, at least on their side of the water, if not also in uh, to the north of uh, to the north of the Gulf. Uh, and so you have a conflict in Iraq and in Syria and to some extent in Bahrain and in Yemen and in Lebanon with the two main antagonists being uh, Iran on the one side and Saudi Arabia, um, it's always seemed to me that the solution is to get the sources of the problem uh, to engage in creating a regional security framework. Um, is that even likely? Is that even on the, on the agenda for anyone? Or is that something that people know about but don't want don't to go there because there's no conditions for it? Well, that's why I, my one point of optimism I started with when we talked about the results of the Vienna meeting was the fact that you had the Saudis and the Iranians in the same room, and at least uh, you know they were at the same table talking about the same topic on an important security issue. Um, I think the main thing for those of us on the outside, and I'm speaking mainly from the standpoint of U.S. policy, uh, ought to bear in mind is is not to get sucked into those those rivalries. I mean, whether it's a mainly a sectarian thing, mainly an ethnic thing, mainly simply a uh, struggle for uh, regional influence between uh, two competing players, um, we, we do not have good reasons to take side in that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we have an interest in regional stability. We don't have an interest in you know, favoring you know, one of those players over the other in terms of degrees of influence. Um, it's the you know, same kind of thing we've always had to encounter in South Asia with the Indians and Pakistanis, mm -hmm. and, you know, where it's hard to do any business without being perceived to take sides, and then it, it makes it very difficult to get things done with either side. Um, I, I think, to be quite blunt, you know, the Saudis uh, and, and, and some of the other, the other the Emiratis and the other Gulf Arabs have been making a big mistake in Yemen with uh, pursuing that war. Uh, clearly, the, the rivalry that you talk about uh, with, with Tehran is, uh, is a big motivator. It's not the only one. But that's, that's created a humanitarian problem, mm -hmm. a problem of instability. And this is not something that uh, I think we ought to take sides on. Next time we'll talk about Yemen. It's okay. a, it's a, it's been a crisis for years, um, and it's getting worse. It's and thank you for joining us. Um, that's all the time we've got. For more information, you can follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA, or check out the website AAIUSA.org. I want to thank you for watching, and see you next week on Viewpoint. Mm -hmm.